Here we go again. You're such a buzzkill. Don't get her started. You know, we're trying to have a good time here. Like, right, we're, it's all love here, right? We don't, why are you bringing all this worldly, political, right, buzzkill, downer issues into our, right? We're trying to get free. And I thought, well, that's really strange, especially if, if for in, at least in my experience of psychedelics and people who take psychedelics and why they value psychedelics is because it helps to critique you. It helps to break you down. It helps to challenge your assumptions, right? Isn't that part of what we find, whether it's in our meditation or our, in our psychedelic practices, is it pushes you to your edge and it teaches you about those assumptions that you're making without even realizing it. And you learn to challenge yourself. Now, I think we see that in our personal lives, when, like in your meditation practice, you, it's not always just about bliss. At least if you've really been meditating for a while, it might be blissy, but after a while you should start to come up against some of your shit, right? Some of your places that you're like, ooh, I am rude as hell. Ooh, I am selfish, right? Like, ooh. And, and you know that you need to do that work. You don't go into meditation, and as soon as you discover something you don't like about yourself, just set it down and walk away. Like, what kind of meditation practice is that? So as I ran into this kind of resistance to talking about politics in our blissed out, psychedelic, raver, burning man communities, I, I found that kind of incongruent with our general critical push, boundaries, work, dig out, find our stuff approaches. And one of the terms that sometimes comes up that I find kind of instructive is that, well, it's disillusioning. It's disillusioning to talk about the political complexities of Burning Man or the political complexities of psychedelics. Well, let's think about the term, disillusion. Isn't that the point? To disillusion yourself. You see what I'm saying? And so in my work, I did it over there, and I've come here to just present to you some of those critical dimensions around how we engage psychedelics and how we engage psychedelic culture writ large in a way that we can be, and this is a phrase I've come to sort of think with, how can we be as rigorous in our engagement with the outer world as we try to be in our engagement of our inner world? Like if you pride yourself on your inner work, whether that's yoga or meditation or community building, right, whatever it is, your inner work, how can you be as rigorous with your outer work and make that connection? And that's what I'd like to talk about today, that, that back and forth. Because I think, and one of the other, I think one of the other things you have to keep in mind when you do a critical engagement with psychedelics is because psychedelics are so stigmatized and they're illegal and they're delegitimized that for many of us, you're already on the defensive half the time because of the sort of the drug war rhetoric, you know what I mean? That's totally not the spirit that I'm coming from. Like, I'm here. I'm, I'm at the table, you know what I mean? And it's because I love this and I love our communities and I love these practices and I think we can continue to do a better job. And so that's the spirit I bring to you, just some questions that I'd like you to take home. I don't have any answers, but I have questions. And so I've, I've also sort of come to think of these questions as like a koan, right? Like what is a koan? Do you ever solve a koan? Kind of, you know? But in some ways, it's the question that you work with again and again that pushes you to do your work. And so that's what I'm hoping to leave you with. Just this koan. In what ways are your practices, your inner practices, grounded in the world? And that's what I'd like to walk through today. So, psychedelics, uh, spirituality in the laboratory, the politics of knowledge of the psychedelic sciences. What's that about? One of the things I, that brought me into studying psychedelics is partly my interest in science and knowledge and consciousness. Now, where did psychedelics come from? Now, most people, when we talk about psychedelics, always think of counterculture, right? You think of Ram Dass, you think of Tim Leary, you think of electric Kool-Aid acid tests, you think of the Merry Pranksters, you take, right? You almost always think of the counterculture, but psychedelics actually don't come from the counterculture. They come out of scientific laboratories. And so I actually restricted my analysis just to the sciences because that's part, partly because that's where it comes out of and partly because science is such a dominant narrative in our culture. So psychedelics started, and does anybody know this history? I'm just curious. Okay, like two people. Okay. Story time? <laughs> okay, so once upon a time in a land far, far away in a pharmaceutical laboratory in Switzerland, there was a man named Albert Hoffman. <laughs> 
So Albert Hoffman was a Swiss chemist, as I said, working in Sandoz Laboratories, which was a pharmaceutical company, and he invented LSD. So right there's a connection, like there's no separating psychedelics and pharmaceutical companies, right? So I was like, huh, because I'm interested in power. Right, and inequality in the pharmaceutical companies is a, is a very dominant part of our scientific landscape. The other place that it came out of was Gordon, there was a man named Gordon Wasson. And Gordon Wasson was an amateur botanist and also vice president of J.P. Morgan Chase, which seldom gets emphasized in our history. Oh, aren't we selective in what we pay attention to? So Gordon Wasson uh, is interested in mushrooms. And so he goes down to Oaxaca, Mexico, and finds Maria Sabina. And Maria Sabina gives him psilocybin mushrooms, right? And then he takes those mushrooms, and he actually sends them back to Albert Hoffman at Sandoz Laboratories, who then synthesizes out psilocybin, named psilocybin. And so whether you're interested in the sort of mushroom ethnobotany side of things, or you're interested in the LSD sort of chemical side of things, both both of those actually come out of a laboratory. You could also talk about uh, Schultz. What's his first name? Thank you. Richard Schulte, who's the father of modern ethnobotany, what Vandana Shiva would call biopiracy, actually. And so he also was a central figure in the early psychedelics movement, going into rainforests and looking for plants and identifying them and then feeding them back into the pharmaceutical industry where they can be synthesized and sold to Western markets so that we could all feel better. So when we talk about the history of psychedelics, we really have to talk about science and their emergence out of a scientific laboratory. So as I was looking at those studies, there was a couple things that I thought were, was quite interesting. First of all, what happened to these scientists when they discovered these, discovered, especially in the case of Wasson, again, I don't know how you discover someone else's property, but he discovered mushrooms or Albert Hoffman in the laboratory, like what happened to them? So both of these men were scientists. 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 They believe in objectivity. They believe in empiricism. They believe that there is a hard material reality. And using our sense data and empiricism in particular methodologies, we can make causal assertions about a material world. That's the framework that they're coming out of. So we'll just start with Albert Hoffman. So Albert Hoffman takes LSD. Right? And it's hard to get more hard science than a chemist, right? Maybe a physicist, right? And so he takes LSD, and what happens? He has his mind totally fucking blown, right? Bicycle day, right? And one of the, how, what happens when he takes psychedelics is it completely undermines his, his belief, and he begins to see it as a belief, in, right? Because in the scientific cosmos, what if there is no objectivity, what if there is no subject-object dualism? What if I am not a reliable observer of the material world? Oh my God, what if there's a God? Scientists aren't allowed to talk about God. And so he has this whole scientific crisis. And he then begins to try to take, the, he's very interested in this substance, and he does a variety, you know, he, he feeds it back into research. He says, well, it undercuts my faith in science and what does this mean for science and how do we know what we know and so he what he decides is to do more science and then he it, he turns it into a whole program of research and then he actually takes the substances and sends it over to Harvard in the psychiatry department to Richard Alpert who becomes Ram Dass and to Timothy Leary and then they do a bunch of experiments at Harvard until uh they're eventually fired from tenure-track positions at Harvard University. Now, there's debate about what they were fired for. Um, I, you know, certainly there were some shenanigans that they were up to that the university did not appreciate. But if you actually trace out the records, which is what I did, there was also very much an objection to their scientific methodology. So it really did become this epistemological crisis for science. And the, it is those crises that I end up tracing out, which is hence the spirituality in the laboratory. Because traditionally, science and religion are over here and over here, right? That's called demarcation for the philosophy of science folks in the room. And so what happens with psychedelics is because typically the scientist is able to, you know, if you go study indigenous spirituality or Christians or religious people or mystics or whoever it is, you can still stay detached from it, right? It doesn't challenge your view, worldview because you're a scientist and you construct truth and Indians just believe mythological things and I can explain your quaint superstitious beliefs in a higher power. But see, LSD is a chemical, 
right? And we love chemicals. That's our avatar. It's material. You can measure it. You can put it on a slide. You can make studies about it. The NIH will fund you, right? And so it created this crisis because they weren't able to dismiss it, right? Just like, oh, right, that's just your little superstitious experience. They had this experience that they could not ignore. And because it came through a chemical that allowed them to study it, they began to engage with spirituality in a way that was historically unprecedented. The doorway, I argue that it's a doorway through which spirituality entered the scientific laboratory in a way that it usually doesn't. And so then my question was, well, what did they do with it? And what conclusions did they come to? And how did they deal with those aspects of the substance and this dialogue of spirituality, given that science and spirituality and the way they approach things is so very, very different? And so I tra that's what I traced out in my dissertation, is what they did with that. So typically, uh, and so I traced that out both from the early scientists and how they negotiated that. And in my dissertation, I have a sort of, I talk about first wave and second wave. Because the, there was the Hoffman in them in the 19, actually late 1940s, 1950s, into the 1960s. LSD is criminalized in 1966. All of the major scientific institutions begin to come down on psychedelics once it's criminalized. And pretty much all research ground to a halt by about the 1970s. I call that first wave. The second wave of scientific uh, psychedelics research reemerged re in 1990 with Richard Strassman's work on DMT, the spirit molecule. And he was the first FDA-approved go ahead, do a clinical trial of psychedelics in the second wave. And so since 1990, after Strassman's work and uh, Deborah Mash with Ibogaine, um, and now, of course, there's John Hopkins and the psilocybin studies and MAPS, right? So we are, are, are I think we are in a, uh, a revival of psychedelics research. So I was also tracing out, like, what was the difference between what those first scholars were doing, those first researchers were doing, and how they were grappling with those conundrums of this crazy substance and their scientific paradigm and what the second group of people did. And one of the, I'll just talk about one of the key differences, which is that if psychedelics are connected to spirituality or mystical experience, which Albert Hoffman argues, Walter Ponke argued, many of the early psychedelicists argued that these, that what was unique about these substances was that they induce spiritual experience or they give you access to the realm of, of, of mysticism. They frame them as spiritual substances. So in the first wave, there was more, I think, more space for that. So Walter Ponke, who was also part of Timothy Leary and Ram Dass at Harvard, who gets talked about less, was coming out of divinity school. And he coined this term experimental mysticism, which is a fascinating term. The science, sort of science and mysticism, science as mysticism. And that during the first wave, there was an emphasis on taking the substance themselves which is also a very strange thing for scientists to argue, right? That you have to experience it yourself. That's inherently non-scientific because science requires shared observation, right? So that was the first wave, and then everybody, everything came crashing down, and they put the total kibosh on it. So in the second wave, what did they do with this question of divinity or also the question of mystical consciousness? Because mystical consciousness, if psychedelics induce mystical states of consciousness, mystical states of consciousness are by definition non-scientific. They're inaccessible to anybody other than the person having it. So what do you do with a, a feeling state that's so difficult to access reliably? And then what do you do with this question of divinity or this idea that it gives, that it gives you access to mysticism or to God or to spirituality within a scientific paradigm? And so what they did in the second wave... Unfortunately, I wish I had more positive things to say about this because what I thought was this is a moment where we could transform our scientific discourses because we have a tendency to get so reductionistic and to be such a slave to empiricism and it's this very narrow worldview in the church of science that we have it all figured out. And I thought if, science, if, if psychedelics teaches you anything is that you sure don't have it all figured out. And so I was like, maybe this will transform science in a way that's interesting. But unfortunately, what has happened is if you want to do research today, you have to get that FDA approval. You have to get that grant money. And where are you going to get that from?
And so there has been a tendency in second wave science to get even more scientific, to reduce everything down to measurable, quantifiable um, dimensions. Uh, and this is again where we come right back into big pharma because who's interested in psychedelics research? Largely pharmaceutical companies to turn it into a pharmaceutical drug or a psychological protocol that can then be utilized as part of our sort of psychopharmacological regime. Now myself as somebody who is fairly critical of science, I worry. I mean, I get it. I get that if you don't do those things, you end up like Ram, Ram Dass and Tim Leary, and we can't do any of the experiments at all. I mean, I get that. But my question is, r like, by appealing to the dominant paradigm, by appealing to Big Pharma, by appealing to the NIH, by embracing these dominant models, I, what is lost? At what cost? And unfortunately, I think that one of the costs that concerns me particularly is what happens to this notion of mystical consciousness and its importance and the notion of divinity, the notion of the sacred, the notion of God, whatever language appeals to you. And you can see this, I think, even more, less so with LSD and more so with the psilocybin mushrooms. Because if you look at the plant-based psychoactives and you go to the indigenous context where people use them, such as the peyote with the Nat uh, Native American tribes and I'm blanking on which tribe, the pay, tribes that pay, utilize peyote, or in this case, the mushrooms in Oaxaca, Mexico, the little children and the little deer. And you ask those indigenous people, what is this substance and what does it do? They say, it is a gift from God. It is an entheogen, right? That's our language for it. It's that which brings God within you. And the little deer and the little children are beings. And they have subjectivity. And what they do is they help you to commune with the divine. And that's what they do. And scientists say, well, that's nice that you believe that. How quaint. We're here to tell you what it really does with a capital R. And what it really does is affect your serotonin levels and your neurotransmitters. And look, we've mapped out the brain. And it's not that there's God and there's nothing sacred and it has nothing to do with divinity. It's just this epiphenomenon of the complex biological brain. And we as sci scientifically oriented people in a scientifically oriented culture, I think too often end up accepting that explanation uncritically. But that's exactly that politics of appropriation, where native peoples or indigenous people say, no, no, it takes you to God, and, the, and that this is a sacred plant. We say, no, it's like aspirin, and we're going to cut it open, and it has nothing to do with God, and we're going to sell it back to you special price. And that's what I argue was troubling to me in my research on the second wave, is that what do they do with this conundrum of divinity? And too often it becomes about psychology. Now, now we're going to turn it into a therapy and it's about the unconscious mind. Or it gets turned into neurology, right? And the brain and we start to do all of this uh, serotonin research. And then the ghost, we're back to the ghost in the machine. And the ghost just becomes a byproduct of the machine. And where did the sacred go? So unfortunately, in my research, I found that we end up just re reinforcing the dominant scientific paradigm. And to me, that's where we get to the politics of knowledge. That that in and of itself is an example of a type of appropriation, where you take this type of knowledge and just take the dominant knowledge and the logics of your own understanding and make it fit. And divinity and the sacred and mysticism and all the consciousness, all the parts that probably most people here who are interested in psychedelics find most interesting, gets washed out. And so what are the politics of knowledge between this subjugated discourse that we all are here to explore when we try to feed it back into the machine. You see what I'm saying?